This is Kitco News special coverage of the Pacific Bitcoin Festival in Los Angeles, California. I'm Michelle McCory. This is Kitco News coming to you from the Pacific Bitcoin Festival in Santa Monica. Many in the markets are hoping for a Fed pivot. But my next guest says when the Fed starts to cut rates, that's when things will break and when the real storm will hit the global economy. Peter St. Ange is an economist at the Heritage Foundation, a former professor. He's also an expert in Austrian economics and Bitcoin and is known for his very insightful daily videos and weekly podcasts about economics and Freedom, big fan of your work. Good to have you with us. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. Even though you have uh, quite a few grim and dire messages, not only about the Fed, <laughs> but you're also right. warning about the so-called fourth turning, a civilizational yeah. crisis, which were overdue, according to most of the models. We'll talk about that. But before we get into that bigger calamity, let's focus on what you're saying could happen in the economy. And you're saying that when the Fed starts to cut rates, that is when things are going to break. You recently cited a report from Bank of America saying that the last Fed hike is the death cross. So expand on that. Right. So the Fed right now is going through roughly 50 year highs in inflation. And the thing that the Fed fears most in the world is inflation because it knows that inflation gets voters riled up and then voters get politicians riled up and the Fed could lose its independence if it's not careful. So the Fed very, very much wants to uh, get inflation down. And what it could do is stand up to federal spending. It could say, we're not going to buy your bonds anymore, so you guys have to cut the deficits. Okay, it could do that, which would actually end inflation in an economically positive way. But instead of doing that, they try to crush the regular economy, and they do that by hiking rates. Right. Okay, so in their models, if they bring interest rates up high enough then they can drain the private sector, and then the economy sort of calms down to the point that inflation goes away. Now, the problem with that is that given that we have two and a half years of inflation that's still stuck, okay, the only reason why the Fed would flip to actually cutting is because they knew they screwed up. Okay, so we are in a very dangerous moment where, on the one hand, if the Fed hikes rates, that keeps strangling the private economy, the productive economy. If they keep rates, rates the same place they are, well then we continue suffering the fallout from these 50 year um, highs in rate hikes. And on the other hand, if they start cutting, what that messages to us is that the Fed is now more afraid of recession than it is of inflation. That only happens if things get really dire. So we're in a, really the Fed has put us into a corner where no matter what it does at this point, uh, it's, it's going to be concerning for us. The only way that we would not have been here is if from day one, the Fed had actually stood up to the feds right when the COVID lockdowns were starting and the federal, the, uh, federal government wanted to print up trillions. If the Fed had stood up at that point and said, we are not going to do that because of what it would do to inflation, then we'd be sitting pretty. But in fact, they didn't do that. But can the Fed do that? I mean, the Fed is supposed to be an apolitical organization. It's not supposed to get involved with that, fiscal policies. That's so, what's funny. Exactly. So, so should it be telling government, hey, let's calm down with this unprecedented stimulus that we saw during COVID? That's exactly the irony. So the Fed is supposed to be independent, meaning that they're supposed to make choices according to what's best for the economy. The federal government, on the other hand, they respond to lobbyists, activists. Okay, so they do their thing. What the Fed has become, especially during COVID, this really happened to central banks all over the world. The central banks became the in-house money printers for the legislators, for the governments in charge. So the governments in charge would come up with some crazy idea, like let's shut down the entire economy. And then they would call up the folks at the, at the Fed or at the central bank, and they would say, okay, what do you need from us? At that point, you don't have an independent central bank anymore. Ironically enough, at that point, they're just at the beck and call. And so I think that's now, really- Are you speculating that yeah. there was this level of coordination? Because again, it is supposed to be an apolitical independent- That's what I'm saying is that ironically, what we've got now is the exact opposite, right? So if the Fed is una unable to say no when Congress would like to do something crazy, then the Fed has no independence at that point. It's just a hand in a glove. That's exactly what happened to the Fed. It's what happened worldwide 
because you know all of us remember the media onslaught at the beginning of COVID. You know any any resistance to any of of the um, economic or social policies that they were imposing. You know at that point you had blood on your hands, so everybody was afraid to say no. And so what we got out of that was just really an epic amount of spending. In the U.S. alone, it was about it was over six trillion in excess spending that was pumped out during COVID. So I believe it was seven and a half trillion. I mean, didn't we increase the money supply by like 40%? That's exactly right. Yeah. So yeah, the, there was a point where one in three dollars had fresh ink. Yeah. So uh, fresh ink from like two yeah. and a half years. That That is epic. That was about twice the pace that they inflated during the 1970s. So everybody knew what happened in the 1970s. You had double digit inflation. You had gold and silver. Gold was up 6x during, during that period in the 1970s. Silver was up 7x. Right, so, and, and yeah. of course at the time, Fed Chair Jerome Powell was trying to assure us that inflation was just transitory, as <laughs> people were calling out this unprecedented <laughs> fiscal and monetary stimulus. Uh, yeah, well, that's the amazing thing. And uh, for the record, Jerome Powell is not an economist. He has no record or no, no, uh, no education in economics. Uh, he's a lawyer, so you know, this isn't terribly surprising. He basically just parrots the party line. And the party line from central banks is that inflation is this just mysterious ether that sort of seeps out of the swamps. And boy, we have no idea where it came from, and our job is to fight it. It is absolute rubbish. <laughs> inflation is produced by central banks. That is what they're paid to do. That's the reason they exist. That's all they do. Uh, and so Jerome Powell, or at least the economists who work with him, hundreds of PhD economists at the Fed, they should have known that if you print yeah. 40% of the money supply. We know exactly what that will do. We've known this for centuries that printing, excuse me, hmm, that was exactly what I figured would happen. We've known for centuries that printing that much money is going to lead to inflation, but yet somehow this time was different. And so the Fed, they sort of smoked their own product and they pretended that you know it was all going to be uh, Mr. Putin or it was going to be the supply chains or right. you know they sort yeah. of trolled through the headlines to look for anything that they could possibly use to scapegoat the inflation that they should have darn known that they were causing for the money printing. All right, but here we are in the situation now and as we said inflation at 40 year highs even though the Fed and the powers that be would like us to think that there is some kind of cooling down in the rate of appreciation of inflation. We'll get to government data in a little bit. But Jerome Powell has been signaling higher for longer. He's been right. signaling that he wants to at least keep this pace. In terms of market expectations, according to the CME FedWatch tool, there's a 77% chance of a hold in November, a 64% chance of another pause in December. Not everyone agrees with this. We've got the likes of JP Morgan Chase CEO Jamie Dimon saying that he wouldn't rule out 7% in terms of where rates could go to. He said that in an interview with Bloomberg in October, yeah. also made those comments to the Times of India. He's warning that we could see 7%. Yeah. And he said like a couple of months ago, or rather several months ago, 5% was considered ridiculous. Nobody thought yeah. that the Fed would even go as high as, as it did now to over 5%. So do you think that the Fed is done hiking or does it go to that extra 7% as Jamie Dimon is saying could be a lot, it could be a possibility? Yeah, a couple months ago, pretty much the consensus was that they were done, that you know, we were going to see some sort of pause for a couple months, maybe three, four months, and then they would start bringing it down. At this point, not only is the market thinking that you know, it's going to be much higher for longer, that we could actually have some serious... Uh, hikes, like Jamie Dimon is saying, uh, Fed officials now are also saying the same thing. So I just I have a video coming out tomorrow uh, talking about um, what uh, Michelle Bauman uh, has been, war who's a uh, Fed official. She's on the FOMC, and she's been warning that rate hikes are going to continue. What changed over the past couple of months is that inflation, headline inflation, has started taking off again. Right. So in Fed world, you have two kinds of inflation that. Um, in terms of public relations, they're very different, right? You have the headline number, which is one that goes up in the newspaper. In a way, that's their most concerning because that's, what, that's the one that um, sort of gets the plebes riled up and gets yeah. Congress asking questions. But then you've got this other one, right, which is the core inflation. I've got different measures of that. And that strips out food and energy. That one doesn't hit the headlines as much, but that's the one that the Fed really worries about because that, in their mind, 
tells you what underlying inflation is, right? It sort of strips out what's happening in the news. The problem at this point is that all of the progress that Joe Biden and the Fed has been bragging about, all of that progress has been headlined. And almost the entirety of it has been energy coming down. Right, and energy has come down, I think for about the past year, but energy came down real hard, came down for two reasons. One of them is that the world digested the Russia war. So, you know, a lot of supply sort of routed around that. Okay. So one reason is that the world sort of digested the uh, Mr. Putin's war in Ukraine. Uh, so they routed around and accessed um, other energy supplies. The other reason is because the world economy has really been slowing in a coordinated fashion, right? We had, I believe it was 276 rate hikes on a global level now. Those, uh, you know, the, those have been at a pace that we haven't seen in about 50 years, and that's really been all across the world. What that has done now is it's brought the European economies right to the edge of recession. It's brought the U.S. to really crawling growth. Uh, it's brought most of the rest of the world uh, into trouble. China, of course, is going through a very rough patch at the moment. What all of those do together is that those lower energy prices a lot, right? Recession, especially global recession, is a huge hit on energy. If we look back to 2008, energy went from about $190 to about $60 over a six month period when the 2008 crisis hits. So we all know that you know, the fastest way to get energy prices down is to kill the global economy. That's essentially what happened. So those have been freebies for the central banks, for the Fed. Okay? That's brought down headline inflation. That's what they've been bragging about. But what they can see is that that underlying inflation that core inflation has barely budged. That's been above 4% for over two years. They're making essentially no progress in that. Okay, so the Fed has already been concerned about that because they're not gonna say it out loud, you know, in front of everybody, they're gonna talk about headline, but they can see in their own models that they're not making any progress. Inflation's not going away. Now, the reason, of course, is that the Fed is unwilling to stand up to federal spending. Yeah. And the federal spending fundamentally is why this inflation keeps going. Even as the Fed tries to crush the private economy, they're sort of clearing the highway so the Feds can drive as fast as possible and the car is not slowing down. Right. So given they're fighting inflation and seeing that it's not really working for a number of factors that you just cited, and of course, uh, raising rates isn't going to do much for energy when we right. basically destroyed the United States energy independence. So we haven't destroyed it, but the Biden administration has severely curtailed it with yes. regulations, right. right? And made the US more dependent on OPEC, Saudi Arabia, which are obviously taking advantage of the situation exactly. and cutting their production. But given that the fight against inflation seems to be the focus, how do you see rate cuts coming into the picture? Right. And, and that's exactly the concern is that because they know that the rate hikes have not worked yet, uh, it, it, that's why the Fed is still leaning towards more hikes, uh, you know, keep, keep beating the patient until, uh, until they don't get up. Uh, and so in that environment, if we get to a point where inflation is still going, yet the Fed starts cutting, that is where that death cross comes in. That's where you would get really concerned because you would say, wait, so the inflation job is not done, but you guys just gave up on the tools that they use to fight inflation, right? So that basically tells you, okay, so you're afraid of something bigger. Yeah. And specifically what they would be afraid of is some sort of massive, maybe not a depression, but a severe recession, something like the 2008 crisis. If that starts coming over the horizon, then at that point, you know, currently they're, they're sort of obsessed on the inflation to knock that out of the headlines. If they see a 2008 style recession coming over the hill, then at that point, they've got to kind of hedge their bets. And, you know, they've got to bring rates down and try and uh, sort of navigate between those two shoals. So that, ironically, I think, would be most concerning for the market. It says the Fed definitely screwed up. Well, we saw what happened with excessive tightening earlier this year right. in the banking sector. Absolutely. Right. I mean, the yeah. thinking was they're going to raise rates until they break something. We started to see breakage in the banking <laughs> right. sector with the right. two of the three largest bank failures in U.S. history yeah. happening. But you're saying that the point of concern is not going to be coming from the bank sector, but rather a recession. And when you say recession, are they going to wait for more than two quarters of negative GDP growth before they cut? Right. Like, what would be the metric for them to measure this is a problem we need to cut? Yeah, I think as far as the banks, those are still a concern. Um, it's sort of a 
rule of thumb that the Fed keeps hiking until it breaks something. They did break something. They broke something major. Uh, the banks that went down in sort of the March period there, that cluster was bigger than the banks that failed in 2008 in terms of assets under management. So that, that was an enormous collapse. That was a very big deal. Now, why did it go away? Why has it been quiet since then? Because the federal government learned their lesson. They pre-bailed out anybody who needed bailing out. So the FDIC extension, where they basically said, no problem, you're a millionaire, we'll cover your bank account, A-OK, -okay, right? That, that broke about a 90-year precedent, right? Which was that the FDIC was supposed to be there for widows and orphans, and it's got enough money to cover the widows and orphans, in other words, the small accounts. Yeah. They drove a truck through that, so that was number one. Number two, they've got the uh, BT, uh, what is it, by the... F, D. Um, they've got all these uh, programs now that they're lending money to banks using fictitious asset values. And they have signaled between Treasury and the Fed, they've signaled that they have an unlimited appetite for that. If the banking system gets into trouble, don't even worry about it. You guys go back to sleep. We'll take care of it. That didn't exist in 2008. I think really the lesson there is that Wall Street learned its lesson. They were not ready to need, uh, for their bailout in 2008. Okay, when it, when it hit, when Lehman went down, uh, the, the, the bankers really had to get on the horn real quick and, and talk to all the bailouties and um, you know, get some cash. They learned their lesson and now the bailouts are apparently institutionalized. And so that's really what happened after the March crisis. Everybody was pre-bailed out. Now, this is gonna cost the American taxpayers trillions of dollars. We've already got trillions on the line that's, that's lent out to these banks or at risk because of the FDIC, which is now horrifically underfunded. Uh, but I think that's why the bank crisis has gone away. Now, of course, all that does is transforms it into taxpayer debt that for the time being yeah. is not causing inflation because the banks sit on it. That was the lesson from 2008. You can, you can print trillions and give it to the banks because they'll just sit on it. Okay, so as long as you do that, it's not gonna bleed out in inflation. It comes out gradually over time. So they've sort of refined the hustle massively after 2008. Uh, you know, after all, 2008 led to the Tea Party. The Tea Party led to Donald Trump, right? So they, they've learned their lesson. They don't want that kind of thing to happen. Now it's under the surface. It's in the back rooms, and then they come out Monday morning. Uh, Janet Yellen, Jerome yeah. Powell, they give us the lectures how the banking system is perfectly sound and safe. And by the way, you guys, taxpayers, you're on the hook for a couple trillion, but you know, we had to do it. Okay, so having said that, you don't think there are going to be more bank failures considering they've worked out this system? I think that um, it is possible that we will have some. Uh, we, had, we had one after the fact, kind of uh, the late one there. It was PacWest? Yeah, yeah, that's true, yeah. Yeah, we've actually had a couple since then. Bank failures do come first, and go. First Republic as yeah, well, which yeah, was... Yeah. Yep, that was over by a Jamie while Diamond. after. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, so I think, yeah, yeah. <laughs> JP Diamond. Um, I do think that we um, are likely to have more bank failures. What I don't think we're going to get is that sort of panicked um, fear like we had back in March that this was going to lead to another 2008. I think that Wall Street lobbyists have been very, very good at putting up dams around it. Okay. And, and in fact, I mean, the, the Fed is in contact with other countries as well. You know, for example, China's been having these problems and we've had Fed contacts directly with the People's Bank of China where they're saying, whatever you guys need, let us know. Okay, so, so it's not yeah. going to be the banks. So back to the original question, Correct. what needs yeah. to happen that gets the Fed and Jerome Powell so worried that they forsake the fight on inflation and start cutting rates? What is that trigger? That's exactly it. Is, right. it. is it markets? Is it negative yeah. GDP? What do they need to pick up on to get them into this panic state of cutting, which you say right. shows that things are worse than we expect. Yeah, the most likely trigger for them, uh, I think the number that they care most about after inflation is gonna be joblessness. And that's really the one that goes up in the numbers. Um, you know, some of the jobs numbers have been a lot weaker recently. Uh, they're still working through some slack uh, through the pandemic. And so if we get a rapid rise in the joblessness rate, that's the kind of thing that will set them off. Um, that scares them really about as much as inflation. If we look back to the 1970s, that was the misery index, right? So that was a way that people sort of uh, looked at how bad the economy is. And the misery index is where you add up the inflation rate and the joblessness rate. Those are the two magic numbers. 
because fundamentally it's not about protecting the economy, it's a PR campaign. Okay, the Fed wants to keep counterfeiting. They want to keep printing money on behalf of their clients at, uh, on Wall Street. And the trick there is how do you keep it out of the headlines? How do you keep the people from getting so upset that they then put pressure on Congress to do something about this cozy relationship that the Fed has with bankers? And so there are really, those are the two key numbers. Either inflation starts coming down, or I think the most likely, we would have some jump in unemployment. Either of those would lead to rate cuts. Okay, and of course, it's an election year next right. year. It's yep. the economy stupid, yep. as the famous saying goes. Will there be political pressure for the Fed to cut because mm -hmm. it's seemingly what the markets want? I think absolutely. Um, it's an open question uh, how much Jerome Powell is interested in resisting that. He's Most of his career, he's been a reliable swamp creature, so... I can't imagine him uh, growing a backbone. Um, I think to a certain degree, he cares about his legacy. And so, you know, he doesn't want to be seen as an absolute tool. And especially if inflation takes off again, then he will go down in the history books as a villain. So I think it's really an open question whether they fight that. But without a doubt, every president puts pressure on the Fed to try to cut rates because they want to get that tissue fire economy. They want to get things okay. jumping up So. Time. So it cuts rates, maybe for political reasons, maybe right. because they're seeing tremendously high unemployment. They forsake right. the, the fight against inflation. And you say the real storm will hit globally. What yeah. does that real storm look like? So the two most recent comparisons we can make are going to be the 2008 crisis and the 1970s. And of course, we had different things in each crisis, right? So the 2008 crisis was really built on uh, the financial system. So money was too cheap, too long. The Really, the entire globe, but particularly the US became over leveraged, and then that sort of house of card fell. Uh, in the 1970s, we had a very different situation. In the 1970s, it was good old-fashioned money printing. And the financialization of America, really that took off more in the 1980s. So in the 70s, we had much less debt, uh, our economy was, was much less sort of finance heavy, okay? And so the concern at this point is that the 1970s was worse than 2008, right? It lasted for a long time. The misery index was off the charts. Uh, that's sort of the benchmark that people go by for disaster. The concern at this point is that we have, we're really mirroring the 1970s, okay? So we've had this jump up in, of, of, uh, in inflation, which actually almost came in at the same numbers as the 70s. Then we've had this dip, and now we've got this, uh, acceleration again. So it's looking a lot like that 70s show, but the problem is that in the 70s, we did not have 33 trillion in debt. We did not have this enormously top-heavy financial system. So the concern is, are we going to get a 2008 crisis, which is um, you know combined with 1970s level inflation? That's something that has not yet happened at the world level. Uh, we don't know if they're going, you know, if the number of um, banks and other financial uh, organizations that are in distress, will those be too big to bail out? China is already at that point. So China has distress across the housing sector, which is enormous in China. Uh, China has already reached the point where they are too big to bail out. They are refusing to bail out a lot of these companies. They're, they're trying to kind of work them out, a lot like what happened with First Republic to kind of, you know, orphan them over to some other organization because they are too big to fail out so, or to bail out. So will that happen at the global level? But when you say, again, that things are going to get really bad, is that going to be reflected in equity markets? Because equity markets are looking forward to a rate cut. For sure. I mean, exactly. you could have a disconnect between the fundamentals of the economy and what you see happening on Wall Street, which happens quite often. But so, so the Fed cuts rates, you don't see that translating into an equity market crash, or do you? I, I, or is it a rally because they've been looking forward to rate cuts? That's exactly right. I think it could honestly go both, go both ways on equities. I think one of the more fascinating things about the past 100 years of history is when we go back, at, we're not getting Weimar in terms of hyperinflation, but when you go back and look at the Weimar era, um, the hyperinflationary era in the 20s in Germany, people were not concerned about the inflation. People were talking about their amazing stock prices, 
Stocks were absolutely soaring. People felt in Germany, they felt like they were getting rich. This was incredible. You could buy a stock and genius, it went up 100 times. And you know, um, people do not connect. So it is, I think, entirely possible uh, that stocks could go either way. If they cut and that you know, gives inflation this sort of uh, second win, then yeah, I, I, I think it's entirely possible that stocks could keep going up. I think the thing to remember about stocks is that people forget, but stocks represent real things. Like stocks in, in, are a commodity. Theory, yeah. In theory, they should represent yeah, exactly. earnings right. of a company that actually does things. But right. now it seems as though with the price to earnings ratio that we're seeing is yeah. that so much of the market is driven by sentiment of future earnings exactly. and future appreciation of the stock right. divorced from the actual fundamental business model of earnings. Yeah. So, you know, you, you would think it represents real things, and for the most part it does, but as I'm saying, right. with, with these prices, it's getting really far and removed from the actual idea of, I buy shares in a company because I think that company's right. gonna do well, <laughs> right. and then I do well with my share as that company does well, and, and right. maybe get a dividend as well. Like, That's, people yeah. are buying things based on appreciation and, and future. Exactly. Earnings. So and, and, and that's the world you get if the central bank gets too big. So the, whatever the central bank is doing, is it creating inflation? Is it doing with the, this with the interest rates? That comes to dominate all of the rest of it, right? Because as you say, in theory, a stock market should represent a bunch of regular companies. They do stuff that you can drop on their foot, on your foot. Um, and if they're doing well- Or provide well, a service, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly, right. So if they're doing well, then the stock mar market should go up. And in fact, we haven't seen that in a very long time. You know, so that's, that's been uh, one of the things over the past couple of years is that, you know, starting in 2020 when they locked down the economy. So this was, by all accounts, this was the most, you know, catastrophic growth moment that we had really since the 1930s. And, you know, this is not controversial. And yet everything went up, right? Everything went up in price. And people said, well, this seems odd. But right, that is the economy we live in now. And, you know, indeed, when you look at every Fed meeting, uh, in, in our world, everybody stops. It's like a new pope is elected, right? Just everybody stops and like, what did Jerome say? This is not healthy. This is not how it's supposed to work. The money is supposed to be a background, like turning on a light switch, okay? The electricity is not supposed to control how Apple or how a factory, yeah. you know, uh, they're not supposed to make their decisions on that, but that's functionally what the money has become because central banks have become way too involved in the process. And that really started, um, you know, if you had to put a specific day on it uh, with the Fed's uh, dual mandate when it sort of got away from the original deal, which was price stability above all, right? The, the original sort of bargain, the way that central banks were, were sold to the public, certainly in the US, was that uh, this is a responsible way for the dollar to hold its value. That has been an absolute joke at this point, right? The dollar has lost over 90% of its value. Uh, and along that way, that's exactly what's happened. The, the central bank has become really the dominant force in equity markets, but really across all markets. Yeah, a central bank of unelected people. They're, not only are they unelected, it's, uh, so the way the US uh, political system works is that the House of Representatives is supposed to be the people's house, right? That's the closest to the people because the districts are small. And in theory, the way it's supposed to work is that the House of Representatives decides all of the budgets. And so uh, they have the power of the purse strings. The one part of the US government, the one significant part, that does not have to listen to the House is the Fed. They have a money printer. They print up their entire budget. That means that they are completely independent from Congress. In other words, they're completely independent from the people. Yeah. So who, who is ruling us? Like, this is supposed to be a democracy, right? Like in theory, we have no voice. The Fed does what it does. This is true with CBDCs as well, by the way. So the Fed is pushing out these CBDC pilots. They have no authorization from, absolutely zero authority to do that. Yeah. It is a rogue organization and it controls us. We've never elected it. Well, CBDC, central bank, digital currencies, a topic I'm very passionate about. So, so we will, we will <laughs> circle back to that one. But I just want to finish the yeah. line of thinking that we are with this Fed rate cut, meaning right. something has broken, not necessarily reflected in the stock market, though, you're saying, because the stock market has been seen as a way to protect against inflation, in right. a way, to protect against dollar debasement, yeah. put your money in the stock market rather than have it sitting right. idly. So you don't see a stock market crash when this happens. 
Uh, what do you see in terms of Bitcoin, in terms of gold, when the when the Fed starts to cut rates? And we'll start with Bitcoin. Yeah, historically, uh, those kinds of um, stagflationary episodes have been very, very good for hard assets, right? So it would be gold, silver. We don't have really a historical example for Bitcoin beyond the 2020 crisis. Uh, that's really been the only sort of global coordinated recession that Bitcoin existed. Uh, but if we extrapolate from the kinds of movements that we had in gold uh, during that crisis, and then we sort of overlay those, then I would be surprised um, if Bitcoin didn't go up a lot. If we get into this sort of stagflationary trap where we're following that 1970s pattern that was kind of like a camel's hump. Okay, so it went up once, came down, then came back up again. So far, we are following that. If we continue following that, then I think we can essentially overlay that onto hard assets and you know, we mentioned at the top, gold went up sixfold in the 70s. Actually, during the entire decade, I think it went up more than that. Uh, silver was up sevenfold. And so at that point, it's, it's kind of an interesting parlor game to ask, well, Bitcoin usually moves a lot more than gold. Uh, and so if we get this sort of second wind on the stagflation and gold soars, what happens to Bitcoin? So I'm very excited to see what exactly happens there, but I would be surprised um, unless Bitcoin went up a lot as well. Okay, so just to recap, we would have stagflation, slower economic growth, higher inflation, yep. a Fed that is still forced to cut rates, yep. um, stock market, you're not sure how that will react. Yeah. But when you say, granted, we don't have real historical models to see what Bitcoin does, but do you have a, a, a projection? Uh, nothing beyond that. A um, guesstimate? Yeah. I, I, normally, I think of Bitcoin in terms of price movement as being super gold. So if gold goes down, Bitcoin goes down a bunch. If gold goes up, Bitcoin goes up a bunch. Okay. All of this is contingent or supposedly based on data, right? Right. right. You said the Fed looks at certain data, markets look at certain data, but you've recently made the point that the data that we're all following so closely yep. can't be trusted because it's constantly getting revised. Right. And I believe you brought up the example of the Bureau of Economic Analysis revising down the last three years of economic data. Of course, it doesn't get picked up by the media Bingo. because right. they start off with the first figure. Nobody comes back and talks about revisions lower because part of the idea for most of the mainstream media is, is to promote Bidenomics. Yeah. But talk us through this idea of how this data that we all place so much emphasis on, and, and certainly the Fed claims to, is in fact rather misleading, shall we say. Yeah, and to be fair, Kitco does report the data three years after the fact, even if the Biden administration doesn't like it. Um, but that's exactly the game. And uh, there's sort of a cottage industry of statisticians who go back and look at these revisions. In theory, the revisions should be sometimes up, sometimes down, right? It should just be a purely technical exercise. So, you know, it was a warm summer, and so we have to adjust that. Uh, but in reality, they are incredibly lopsided, and they tend to be lopsided uh, at the moment for Joe Biden, but generally they tend to be lopsided for the whoever the deep state likes. So um, it tends to go by political party. Uh, under Donald Trump, it, it was, if anything, the revisions were the other direction. And those kinds of patterns would suggest that what's happening here, uh, which is what you would expect in any bureaucracy, is that the bureaucrats are responding to the people who pay their bills. Right? Bureaucrats, in theory, they have a job, which is to put out accurate unemployment statistics for the American public. But in reality, they have somebody who controls their budget. And that person is usually in the White House, I think in the case of Donald Trump, uh, because he was so universally hated by the, uh, by the federal bureaucracy, um, <laughs> I think it kind of flipped around with him. Uh, and so the concern at this point is that if we look at these revisions, they are generally sugarcoating almost across the board. And then once the media has forgotten about it, right? you mentioned the BEA. So they went back and looked at data three years ago. There is almost nobody aside from Kitco who is actually paying attention to revisions from three years ago. right? So they get the political juice from it today. Uh, and then they have to revise at some point because otherwise they can't say they're objective. Right? So yes, they eventually tell the truth when it doesn't matter anymore. So the concern at this point I think beyond sort of the injustice of, you know, people, we the taxpayers pay these guys salaries, right? The least they could do is actually uh, tell the truth. Uh, but then the other concern with that is, is the Fed correctly controlling for that? 
right? So the Fed can only see what's on a slow instrument panel. And I could imagine the Fed not being sympathetic to that bureaucratic model of <laughs> yeah. statistical motivation. So like if the Fed actually believes its own product, uh, I think that could be very concerning and it could just end up creating noise where, you know, for example, the economy may be a lot weaker than it appears on paper. If the Fed were actually trying to reach the truth, then they would go ahead and adjust for that. They would kind of have their own whisper number. Uh, I'm concerned that they might not do that uh, because you're probably not allowed to say that in public in, w within a Fed setting. We can say it in public. This is Kitco News special coverage of the Pacific Bitcoin Festival in Los Angeles, California.